When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> What a beautiful morning. Sunny, warm, the birds are chirping. I think it's time for tea. Uh, let's see here. Ah, uh, yes. I'll get some vodka. This, this red looking stuff. Alright, a spritz of lime. Uh, some ice. Ah, yes. Some ice here. There we are. Aha. And we'll stir it all up with a celery stick. There we are. Ah. Oh, what the bloody... The blood in a Bloody Mary isn't supposed to be actual blood. Wait a minute. A beautiful morning. I should be asleep. Something is terribly wrong. Uh, let's see. Oh. Now it's a bloody desert. And wait. Someone is out there. I think I see a... Uh, looks like a woman... And, oh, damn it, I'm trapped in someone else's dream again, aren't I? <sighs> well, I suppose I should sit back and enjoy the show. Uh, seems to be some sort of desert dream. Hmm. Not half bad if you have a taste for copper. Desert, Desert Dream, Dream. by Christina, Christina Danks. Danks, narrated, narrated by, by Courtney, Courtney Holmes. Holmes. The human brain is an odd thing. Your memories, mostly from your childhood, are vague and ambiguous. Is what you remember even real? Could it be that you've manufactured your childhood memories from the stories your parents tell you about yourself? Think about it for a second. Do you actually remember? For me, I don't think I do. Why? Well, my story, the story I'm telling, will explain why. I've had this reoccurring dream since I was a child. Maybe around eight? I can't exactly recall when it started. My dream is, well, simple. I'm standing in the middle of a desert, alone, isolated from humanity. It's always daytime when I come here. I say when I come here because this is where I always am in my dream. It's really hot. There's beads of sweat trickling down my forehead. The sweat lingers for a minute at the tip of my nose and drops onto the sand. It's so quiet that I can hear the sizzling sound of the sweat as it hits the scorching sand. I look down and see that I'm standing there barefoot, not just barefoot, completely nude, but the sand isn't burning me. I just stand there in the isolated silence for the entire dream. That is until the end. A giant wave, yes, a giant wave in the middle of the desert comes out of nowhere. I try to run from it, but I'm firmly planted into the ground and I can't move. The wave hits me with such force. I swear I can feel it. I can feel the water going into my nose, my mouth, my ears. Then suddenly, darkness. I'm laying there. I don't know if I'm in my bed or if I'm somewhere else. There's a cloth of some sort covering my entire body. I think I'm dead, but I can hear my heart beating. Pump, pump, pump. A steady, healthy beat. 
I can feel the blood coursing through my veins, except I'm not breathing. I take one giant gulp of breath in and I wake up. It's the exact same every time. I know what to expect, when to expect it, but I can't control the dream. I know what you're thinking. Go see a psychiatrist. You don't think I have? Of course I have. That's why I've been prescribed everything from sleeping pills to antidepressant medications. None have helped. And want to know something else that's odd? I don't dream, except for that dream. Sometimes I don't think that this dream is a dream. I think it's real. But I have to gather my composure and tell myself that I'm just paranoid, right? I'm a single 30-some-year-old woman with no husband, no kids, so yes, it is possible that I might be slightly depressed. But I can assure you that I'm not crazy. Something happened to me a year ago, and ever since then, I've never been the same. I was driving home from the grocery store when I fell asleep at the wheel. I don't know why. I don't know how. I just suddenly got extremely tired and couldn't keep my eyes open. I blacked out. When I opened my eyes, I was, where else, but the desert. The exact same desert as I had seen so many times in my dream, except this time it was different. I was inside of a tube filled with liquid, like a fetus. I freaked out and started touching my body to see if I was still an, an adult human. Thankfully, I was, not that it made me feel any better. I was in so much shock when I first opened my eyes that I didn't notice what was around me. I, floating in this glass jar filled with a mysterious liquid, could barely see what was out in the desert. But as I squinted, I could not believe what I saw. I saw millions, if not billions of tubes, like the one I was in. There were people in them, strangers, small, medium, big, female, male, young, old, people of all colors, I immediately got nauseous. I stuck my face to the glass to try to get a better look at these strangers and all of their eyes were closed. They looked dead. I closed my eyes and kept repeating over and over again. This is not real, this is not real, this is not real. I probably said it a hundred times, but I still felt the liquid caressing my body. I started to cry. Not that anyone or anything would have noticed. I frantically started punching the glass, but the liquid made the force of movement much slower. I had no success. It was then that I realized there were wires sticking out of my head. Oh God, they were inside my skull, attached to my brain, I would assume. I touched them gently and shuddered. Chills ran through my spine. I didn't know what to think. Can I rip these out? Will this kill me? Would it matter? I'm probably already dead. So I said, fuck it, and ripped the wires out of my skull. Fuck, it hurt so bad. Crimson red filled my entire tube. I thought, this is when I die. Just accept it. So I floated there, waiting for the darkness, but then suddenly I heard a noise. I looked around and didn't see anything. I looked up and I saw a glimmer of light shining through. That's when I realized that the latch closing the tube had opened itself at the top. I popped my bloody head, and there it was, that hot sun beating on my face. I'd never been so happy to breathe in air. That is until I started choking on it. I was gasping and coughing and gasping and coughing. It was like my lungs had never breathed air before. After a good two minutes of pain, my lungs started working again. I plunged out of the tube onto the hot sand, that sizzling sound that filled my ears, except this time, I could feel the heat. I could feel the hot sand against my skin. It felt like freshly heated griddle against my body. Fuck it, fuck it, fuck it, this isn't real. This is a fucking dream, I'm dead, just go. I got up, burned, bloody, and naked. I started running towards the closest tube. I didn't know who was in there, but I didn't care. I just wanted to get the hell out of here. I knocked on the glass, screaming and crying, PLEASE WAKE UP! Nothing. I sat down on the sand in front of the stranger's tube. Hopeless, I put my face into my palms and started bawling. 
This is what my dreams have been warning me about. I'm going to die one day. I'm going to end up in my own hell and this is it. Then, something came over me. I don't know what it was, but I looked up at the stranger in the tube and I felt this was not the end for me. I felt that there was something more to this place, not that I am special or anything, but that I was meant to come here. And all those nights, waking up, wondering what the hell this dream meant led me to this point. There must be a deeper meaning to this. I stood up, wiped the mixture of blood and tears from my face and climbed into the top of the tube. I started pulling the latch as hard as I could, but it would not bulge. Not one bit. I sighed. And as I was about to jump off, I saw the circular impression on the top of the tube. I touched it. Nothing. I pushed it and it opened. It opened just enough for me to stick my arm through. What the hell? I stuck my arm in and swished it around, trying to feel for the wires. The top of the tube is black, so I couldn't see where my hand was going. I felt something, so I just grabbed it. I think it was the stranger's shoulders. As my skin touched his, I felt this surge of electromagnetic energy. My muscles started cramping up and I felt my entire body stiffen. I couldn't control my body. My eyes began rolling into the back of my head. I heard a loud sound, an alarm-like sound. It went beep and it didn't stop. I wasn't able to take my hands off the stranger. I was stuck here. I began to freak out and then I saw it. It was his name. He lived in Moscow, Russia. I saw his life through his eyes. I knew his every thought, his every move. Things I didn't want to see, I saw. I started screaming, but no words came out, just cries of despair. When the vision of his life finally stopped, I flew about a hundred feet and landed in the sand. The loud sound was still going. It was deafening. The life had been drained out of me. I laid there gasping for air, my mind racing a mile a minute. My muscles were still cramped and I could feel air escaping my lungs. I started to come in and out of consciousness. I was groggy, but I heard inaudible sounds coming from around me. It sounded like people, real humans. I felt relief for a brief moment, like I was going to be okay. I felt them. There was definitely more than one. They grabbed me. They were carrying me. Thank God they were taking me to get help. Then, I felt my body get dunked back into the mysterious liquid. That's when I realized, nope, I am not going to be okay. Before I completely blacked out, I heard the latch above me close and lock. Pitch black. The next thing I remember, I woke up and saw one of my girlfriends, a strange man and two strange women standing there staring at me. I was so confused. My friends started tearing up but I had no time for emotions. I was confused as fuck. She started whimpering. I can't believe it, you're... I immediately cut her off. What? What are you talking about? I need to talk to the police. I need to talk to someone. Calm down. You are in good hands. Do you know where you are? The strange man came closer to me. That's when I saw the name tag. Doctor? I realized I was at a hospital. The hospital? I said reluctantly. As confused as I was, I was relieved. He smiled. Yes, you have been in a coma for two months. You were in a bad crash, but you're going to be okay. We're just glad to have you back with us. We almost lost you a couple of times. Your lungs collapsed, you had burns all over your body, and severe swelling in the brain. We thought there was a high possibility that you were going to be a vegetable for the rest of your life. But it looks like you'll be fine. I, uh, thanks? I didn't know what to say. I wanted to get home. Let's fill out the paperwork and get you out of here. The doctor said as he waved for the two nurses to follow him out of the room. My friend held my hand and asked, Promise me you'll take care of yourself? Yeah, I looked at her. Hey, uh, thanks for being here. Oh my god, of course. The others visited you too, but you weren't awake. I came on a good day, she smiled. I looked around my room. There were flowers, cards, chocolates, and balloons everywhere. I'm not gonna lie. It felt good 
to know that people still cared about me. I was relieved that I was okay, but more so that I was no longer in that tube in the desert. Now, yes, this might just be another one of those. I was in a coma and I saw some crazy shit because my mind was tripping for two months kind of story, but I honestly laughed when I got home from the hospital. There was just one thing, one little thing I tried to explain why, but couldn't. It always nudged at me, so recently, about a week ago, I went onto Facebook and searched for the stranger's name that I had seen in the desert, keeping it anonymous for the sake of the person's privacy. I was pretty confident I wouldn't find anything, but there was a glimmer of doubt, so I wanted to be 100% sure. As the browser loaded, I anxiously watched the screen. The results popped up. I didn't recognize any of the faces. Thank God. As I was about to exit the browser, I saw that there were two more profiles that I needed to scroll down to see. My hands were shaking. I began to scroll. The first face? Nope. I felt slightly better. Now down to the last profile? Nope. So much relief. But wait, the face on the last profile? It looked familiar. It wasn't him, but... I stared at it for a minute. I felt my stomach drop. I've seen this face. It's his. Kid. I clicked on the profile and quickly clicked through the pictures he had available to the public, and there they were. Pictures of that stranger's face although he no longer was a stranger to me like I was to him. I kept clicking through. Yup, that's his wife. That's his house. That's the restaurant he always eats at on Fridays. Holy fuck! I slammed my laptop shut. Denial. I had been in denial for a year. That's why I'm writing this. I can't explain to you why it happened to me, not you, but it happened. Believe me. Don't believe me? I don't care. All I can say is that I have come to understand that my time in the desert was real. It was not a figment of my imagination, but a genuine experience. I don't know what I discovered, but what I believe is that the lives we are living right now are fabricated lies. The experiences we perceive as ours aren't ours at all. We are just one of billions of strangers trapped in tubes, part of a bigger experiment something more mysterious than any of us could ever understand. Huh. What a rude way of discovering you live in the Matrix. Well, I suppose now that that's over, we can... Ah, much better. Now, ah, let's get back to sleep. Oh, well, I guess you have something to talk about as well. You're, you're here to tell me about what now? Ah, I see, a salesman. All right, then. Tell me about this gift of mortality. The Gift, the gift of Mortality, of mortality. By the Doctor, otherwise known as Mateo Arts. Death. For many it is a concept to be feared, to be respected. It is the ender of relationships, of knowledge, of everything that you were and will have ever been. They see it as nothing but a monster the blades ready at a moment's notice to cut clean through the fragile string you call your life. For others, it is but the next great step in the journey of existence. When it is time for them to shed their physical bond with the world, they do so gladly and without hesitation. They know not what waits beyond, but hope that there is yet more to discover, to experience, to explore. They are happy to go on. Some simply consider it an escape, a way to flee from the pain of living, the hurt that comes from simply being alive. When life becomes too much to bear, they welcome the embrace of death 
regardless of what may follow after. For them, they do not care about meeting it prematurely, or if there is more. They only desire for their suffering to cease. The one thing that all agree upon is that death is a universal truth. Just as every being has a beginning, there must also come an end. Everyone prepares for it in different ways, but the result is always the same. No matter the person, no matter the status, no matter your wealth, riches, family, friends, everyone finds themselves in the ground one day. But what if that weren't true? Let us consider the fantastic. If we were to delve into the realm of imagination and say, perhaps, that you were undying, what would the ramifications be? Well, there are two aspects to consider, physical and mental. Let us assume for a moment that even if you weren't to die, your body would still be susceptible to aging, to disease, to lacerations. If you were to continue aging far beyond the limits of our programmed destruction, life would quickly become a living hell. Your body would degrade, becoming weaker and weaker with each passing day. Eventually, if it hadn't happened already, you'd no longer be able to walk as your muscles and bones would have become far too fragile to support your weight. Soon, you wouldn't be able to move at all lest you tear your body apart. And once your eyes were used up and dry, the world would turn black to them as well as the rest of your senses in due time. Imagine a fate such as that, paralyzed, blind and deaf to reality, but alive. A mass of disintegrated bone and flesh, maybe no more than a puddle of soupy tissue, but yes, alive. Not so extravagant a thought, is it? Or maybe... Earlier in your eternal life, you found yourself struck down with a disease of some kind, maybe cancer. While many others have failed to beat it, you wouldn't. However, perhaps you wouldn't quite succeed either. It is possible to assume that without proper and timely treatment, you'd simply be stuck in a stalemate with it for the rest of your life, which in your case is a long while. Imagine the pain that others go through in those last few months of their life where many people are ever eager for their death to arrive, for an end to their suffering, a torture so great it forces people to beg for the sweet release of life leaving their bodies. But that isn't an available option to you, is it? No. You'll simply be left to your torment as the tumors continually grow, pressing hard against your bones, your nerves, your muscles, enveloping everything inside you. Who knows what will happen given enough time? No one before you has lived long enough to see. And finally, what if you were wounded? What if you were tortured? If they cut your limbs apart and left you there because they have a guarantee you won't die? What if they removed your skin inch by inch until you were nothing but bloody muscle and tendon underneath? Where even the lightest of touches would send cascading waves of pain throughout your vessel, but not kill you? That is what you face on the physical aspect, if you were to become invulnerable to death. But now, 
we must move on to the mental consequences. Let us ignore all of what has been stated above and imagine that you're a perfectly healthy individual. No sickness and no aging. For 50 years or so, you might feel very confident about your choice. But what happens when your family starts to die? Your parents may be expected, but your siblings? What of your best friends? Having to watch each one's last breath clasp each hand as their strength leaves them. How many funerals would you have to attend? when everyone you've ever known and loved has died. How would you maintain a family? If you were to bear children with your wife or husband, how would that impact your relationship? As they continue to age and grow older as you stayed the same, a single moment of your life frozen in time forever. Eventually, your children would surpass you, and not only would you witness the death of your significant other, but it would be your children whose hands you must hold as they travel into the next realm, and then your grandchildren, and their children, and so forth. It's all right. You'll start over. In a few decades, you'll be able to move on, to leave and start a different bloodline than the one you've now abandoned. And then you'll have to undergo the same process again. Losing your love, then your children, over and over with each new glimmer of hope you gain to lead a normal life. They say that there's no greater punishment than having to bury one of your own children well, you'll have to bury all of them. Maybe you grow wise and distance yourself from humanity before you go insane from the mental stress that simply existing places on your mind. That's only a temporary solution, unfortunately. Everything is when you can't die. When the Earth falls into the sun in billions of years, and the sun burns itself out of existence. What then is left? You'd still be there, the one constant in the entirety of the universe, floating through dust and ghosts of your solar system throughout the dark void of space. No oxygen, no heat, and no company. Completely alone for the rest of eternity. When the universe finally dies, will that be the end of you? Will it finally be your time, or will you be forced to still linger on, witnessing reality as it was never meant to be seen? Such is the gift of mortality. Everyone at some point in their life asks themselves, what would it be like to live forever? That's not the question they should be asking. The true question you should ask yourself is this. What happens when an immortal wants to die? Hmm. Nope. Not buying it. See, you fail to take into consideration the multiverse theory, and we immortals who can traverse it. Now, good day, sir. Now, I'm confused. Am I still in someone's dream, or was that an actual sales pitch? Though I suppose in my line of work, it could be one and the same. Oh, oh. Still in dreams. Ah, uh, very well. What's the next one? Oh, you there in the darkness with the blue eyes. What have you to tell me? What do you like about playing under the bed? Well, honestly, I don't. But let's see this dream anyway.
What do you like about playing under the bed? By Crazy Ninja. It all started when I was eight or nine years old. Actually, I guess it may have been earlier, but that's around the first memory I have of it. See, I have had sleep paralysis as long as I can remember. Although it is rare now that I am an adult, most people that I've told about this have assumed I'm just scared of the dark or have had bad nightmares, but that's not it. Although I am, and I do. <laughs> I have always had very vivid dreams. When I was dreaming, I was there. I could see, smell, hear, and feel. I was also a very adept lucid dreamer, having the choice to affect my dreams at will. That didn't work on nightmares though, and I often had nightmares before these episodes. Horribly vivid nightmares. Almost every night. Dreams of falling, fire, death, being alone in an empty space, but mostly monsters. And those were the worst. Some of them were your classic 80s slasher film icons. Jason, Freddy, etc. I think my mom let me watch those movies a little too young. Along with reading Stephen King. But she is still my hero. Those usually involved running and hiding while being in a strange place. Usually creepy, abandoned buildings or out in the woods. The monsters that didn't come from movies were way worse, though. Dreams come from your subconscious, supposedly. So I guess somehow my mind created them. Although as a child, it seemed like they were from the very depths of hell. Twisted, grotesque things, sometimes vaguely resembling a human form, with missing limbs or too many. Hideous faces with skin missing or eyes hanging out of sockets. Some were not human at all, however. Giant creatures with wings and razor-sharp claws and teeth, black shadows with red eyes that would just stand in the corner and watch me while I went about mundane tasks, like homework or watching TV. Sometimes I would wake up before they got me. Not always. People say you're not supposed to die in dreams, but I have many, many times. I have fallen and hit the ground. I've burned up in the fire, been stabbed and slice. I've even had a dream where I was at a funeral that turned out to be mine. I didn't go back to sleep that night. Well, I'm not really scared of the dark per se, or even scared of the nightmares. I am afraid of waking up in the dark. Let me explain what a typical night was for me when I was younger and maybe you can start to understand. I would fall asleep in my bedroom with the TV on, mostly for light. Sound would be just loud enough to make out what they were saying. Sometimes I would fall asleep on the couch with the light and the sound coming from my parents' room before I had a TV in my own room. Then the dream would start. The worst one ever, which I had often. I don't know how rare reoccurring dreams are, but I feel I got more than my fair share, would start with me waking up in my own bed. I would be viewing as though through my own eyes rather than third person as a lot of dreams were. I would look over at my alarm, and it would say 3.33 a.m. Always. Then the fear would start. I knew what was coming, but powerless to prevent it. I would slowly place my feet on the floor and stand up while stretching and yawning. I'd start to head for the bathroom. Not sure how I know the bathroom was my destination as I never made it there. And I would trip on something. 
I crash on the floor, hitting my nightstand, causing my alarm clock to fall on my head and bounce to the floor. So I'm lying there, cursing myself and looking under my bed. There's nothing there. And I mean nothing. The meager light in my room should penetrate at least a few inches into the darkness, but it's like a wall of black shadow, an empty void. I crash on the floor, hitting my nightstand, causing my alarm clock to fall on my head and bounce to the floor. So I'm lying there, cursing myself and looking under my bed. There is nothing there, and I mean nothing. The meager light in my room should penetrate at least a few inches into the darkness, but it's like a wall of black shadow, an empty void. And I freeze with fear. Suddenly, two small blue orbs of fire appear directly eye-level with me, the eyes of some unknown being staring into my soul. Its breath was the worst part. I would see it and smell it at the same time. I only know it was breathing because it came out in a fog, like when you are outside in winter, only it wasn't cold in my room, and the breath upon my face was cold enough to chill me to the bone. And the stench, ugh. It was as though someone took dead animal carcasses and dirty diapers and lit them on fire with a thousand matches, like sulfur, burnt hair, and shit. My mind would be screaming, Run! Hide! But my body is frozen. I am hyper-aware. I can feel every muscle in my body tense up in preparation but nothing happens. Then it grabs me. I see nothing, no limb of any sort, but I am being dragged under the bed. Then I am in total blackness. I can feel its disgusting breath on my neck and hear my heartbeat, but my sense of sight has totally abandoned me. I don't feel arms around me specifically, but I am being held there. It feels like someone has wrapped a blanket made of flesh around me, but it is stronger than I am and holds me completely still. Then, I feel its tongue slowly lick from my neck to my ear, as though tasting my fear. In a voice I can only describe as broken glass soaking in blood, gravelly and grating but wet, it whispers. What do you like about playing under the bed? That's when I snap out of it. I struggle and fight, swinging my elbows and kicking my legs as hard as I can, eventually loosening the creature's grip. And I would wake up. Here's where the real fun begins. I would be completely frozen, sometimes to the point where I could not even open my eyes. Sometimes that would be all, just frozen for a minute or two, then I would snap out of it. I'm getting a little freaked out even writing about it. The memories are that vivid as it comes out. Other times, the nightmares followed me. I remember once I was lying there, frozen, trying to force my eyes to close, when I heard the same thick, gravelly voice say, Come back under the bed. The games were just starting. I couldn't turn my head to look toward the sound. Not sure I would, even if I could, but I could feel its cold breath on my ear. I guess I must have screamed, although I don't remember doing so because my mom ran into the room and turned on the light. I swear, I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye melt into the floor heading back under the bed. She checked, assured me there was nothing under the bed. I still don't know what to believe. According to the therapists and counselors I have talked to, I was experiencing visual and auditory hallucinations common to sleep paralysis. 
They don't know how real it was, though. When I would wake up in bed, once able to move, I would jump off my bed, making sure to stay well away from the edge, run to my parents' bedroom, and crawl into bed with them. Sadly, until I was about 14. Oftentimes, though, I would not wake up in my bed as I had fallen asleep. Sometimes, after that specific dream, I would wake up on the floor next to my bed, which was the worst, especially if the paralysis kicked in, which was often. I've woken up on the couch, on the floor in my parents' room, on the kitchen floor, in the empty bathtub, even once on my porch. On these occasions, I would sometimes find scratches and cuts on my body, often small, although once I had a six-inch gouge across my rib cage, still have the scar. The therapist said this was due to sleepwalking and running into things. My grandmother had a very different view of things. I loved my grandma. She definitely wasn't your regular sweet old lady. My grandmother had a deep appreciation for the occult. When I told her about my dreams, she crossed herself and did that weird little evil eye hand gesture. I asked why she was freaking out. My dear, 3.33 is the time of evil, she explained. Three is a number of Satan. 3 a.m. is the witching hour, dear, when the veil between realms is thin and reality can be warped. It was more likely that it was an actual demon trying to drag you to the underworld. You are lucky to have survived the attacks. She also told me that I wasn't sleepwalking as the therapist suggested, but actually in another... I guess you'd say alternate plane or dimension, or even the underworld. We always thought she was a little crazy. Now I'm not so sure. I wish she was still alive to help my family. Recently, my seven-year-old son has been waking up in the middle of the night, right around 3.30 a.m., screaming about the monster with blue fire eyes. I was holding him after one recent episode, telling him it was a dream and he will be okay. He kept repeating the word, no. When I got him to calm down a little, I asked why he was saying no. He said he doesn't want to play under the bed. Some humans can be so bizarre. I, I think he needs to take a lesson from the Japanese. The damned blue-eyed fiend of his could be defeated by a futon. <sighs> well, that was troublesome. I suppose it's back to bed I go. Good night, kitties, and good morning, or... Uh, damn it all, I'm going to bed. No poem for you. The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2017 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. You can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Jason White at 
soundcloud.com slash angels dash of dash despair and Miu at soundcloud.com slash M-Y-U-U. Details can be found in the short notes. If you want to support this show, please go to www.patreon.com slash the mad catter. For more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hats or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. You can also download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hats. Well then, good night, kitties, and sweet dreams.